On the outskirts of Stirling stands Bannockburn House, a once forgotten historical site that resonates with the footsteps and stories of years gone by. The house, now quiet and empty, was once filled with history and intrigue, and the people who lived and worked there are now just distant memories. In 1567, Mary, Queen of Scots, bestowed upon Sir Robert Drummond the barony of Bannockburn, and Drummond's Hall was subsequently built on the land by his grandson. The hall stood on the site until eventually being demolished to make way for Bannockburn House. The ownership of the lands shifted to the Rollo family in 1636, with Sir Andrew Rollo being granted the baronetcy by King Charles II in 1651. Then a few years later, in 1672, the land passed into the hands of the Patterson family. Construction of the house began in the late 1700s and was completed by Sir Hugh Patterson in 1675. Hidden from prying eyes, this architectural marvel stands proudly near an ancient Roman road, bearing witness to the countless legions that marched through northern Scotland during Roman invasions. This stately home, however, is not just a silent witness to history, but an active participant. It sheltered the illustrious Bonnie Prince Charlie, a key figure in the Jacobite Rising of 1745, and became the stage for a dramatic event, a daring assassination attempt on the charismatic prince while he resided within its walls. As the centuries passed, Bannockburn House faced periods of neglect and challenges. The 20th century saw it abandoned and vulnerable. In 1972, a fire left its mark consuming the drawing room and leaving scars that added to the house's mystique. In a remarkable turn of events, the local community rallied together in 2017 to rescue this historical treasure. The house and its surrounding land were acquired, not just as a property, but as a collective commitment to preserve a piece of Scotland's rich heritage. In October 2023, I had the remarkable chance to explore Bannockburn House on a guided tour led by Paul Hannan, the Paranormal Events Manager, along with volunteers Lindsay and Lucy. Together, they took me on a captivating journey through this historic building, unveiling its layers of history, sharing tales of ghostly residents and delving into its intriguing historical events. On that night, I recorded the stories they shared with me. While I must apologise for some of the audio quality, I hope you'll find the first-hand accounts and stories as interesting as I did. Join us to hear the enthralling history and hauntings of Bannockburn House. We start the night off in the Lay Hall, the room that greets you as you enter the house. The ceiling in the hall is an incredible example of an ornate plaster ceiling created by the same people who made the ceilings in Holyrood Palace. So this is called the Lay Hall. So we have two, um, we have the lower hall and the top hall here. It would originally be um, made into two separate things. You wouldn't have the gallery here. It wasn't until the Victorian era that they took out this, due to the fact that uh, when the building was first bought, uh, built, it was uh, um, 1665 ish, around about that time. And we've got the gentleman over here. We've got uh, a few pictures in the hall here. This first gentleman is uh, Hugh Patterson the first, then we've got Hugh Patterson the second, and we've got Hugh Patterson the third over here. So these guys are all Jacobite um, enthusiasts or uh, sympathisers, hence the reason why we have a picture of Bonnie Prince Charlie here as well. Um, Hugh Patterson the first would have been involved in the first Jacobite uprising, and all the way around to the second, uh, the third guy here, who actually did have Bonnie Prince Charlie in the house. Um, this is I don't know if you know anything about Bonnie Prince Charlie. He had uh, a romance with uh, Clementine Walkinshaw, who is this lady here, and they had a child out of wedlock. Um, and then um, this lady on the side is actually her mother. So it's um, Hugh Patterson III's sister. So what we think may have happened, it's not official, mm. but they, she was the tenth, like quite low down, a daughter, and they've tried to pair her off 
with right. Coach Tally, or something has happened that they've connected together. But because she wasn't classed as a rich enough person, they never actually married. She would have been still classed as a commoner. And they had a child together. Yeah. Uh, who's this lady here? I don't. I didn't actually realise that Charlie had kids or a kid until um, I came here. She was never limitized until um, later on in the in her age when she actually looked after him. Right. When he was consumed by the drink. Charlotte. Uh, so that's Charlotte. Um, so she was later um, named Duchess of Albany, which uh, there is actually a poem, possibly a song called the Duchess here of Albany. Um, so yeah. And we've got Lady Barrowfield over here, who is the, the mother of uh, Clementina. Um, again, you've got, like I was saying, it wasn't, wouldn't have been t until later that they opened up the floor here to see the um, ceiling, because you would have hidden your well to start with, mm. and then it wasn't until like the Victorian era they started to show off that they had money. It is an incredible ceiling. That would have been all, we, we will be going up there later and be a bit closer. That would be all handmade. That is original. So we can go through to the library. Our first room proper is the library. The room has a large table in the centre and a bay window which looks out into the lush gardens. By the window you'll find a coffee table and some chairs. And it's here that the ghost of a former owner is often seen. Walking through the corridor here, um, and we're going into the library. So we're now into the library. Um, this is um, where Annie Mitchell, who's this lady here at the, in the middle of this picture here. This is just some of the past owners of the house. Um, so. She, this is supposed to be one of her favourite places and she would sit over in that corner which opens out to bay windows which is actually an extension uh, that has been put in at later date and she used to look out at the gardeners to make sure that they were behaving and doing the jobs that they were doing and we have um, had a previous volunteer who's actually passed away now but he did confirm that she would make sure that the gardeners were behaving and he said that he would hide so he could get up to Miss Chief and not get seen by her. So we've got um, Colonel Wilson here and then we have A.E. Picard and that's another gentleman that you may, may have been uh, know of if you go through to Glasgow. One Lord maybe um, he did all the Pan Panatonicon in Glasgow if I pronounce that right. Uh, it's a, a theatre in Glasgow, so he actually owned the house as well at one point. But unfortunately, he only had owned the house for about one or two years because then he passed away because he was in his nineties right. at that time. This is a very interesting room. We do see there's pictures on the walls as well. This is to celebrate the past and present volunteers to do with the community trust. So. We had, there was another volunteer that um, wanted to do this. He, they were all actually photos. So, hmm. just to... Yeah, they're great. I remember seeing them when we, I came on the ghost in here. They're a really good idea. It yeah. really brings the place to life and brings the people that are helping out to life as well. It's great. So it's a mixture of past and present uh, volunteers. There's actually none of the volunteers here because <laughs> I joined a bit later on when after they uh, finished doing this. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. So, um, like I said, this is this is actually known as the Mitchell Library, but it has no connection to the Mitchell Library in Glasgow. It's just what we have nicknamed it mm. because of its being Annie Mitchell's favourite place. And from from memory, the stories are that her spirit is still seen. In that chair, looking out the window. Potentially, yes. Potentially. Yeah. Uh, depends who you speak to, to what stories we get. Yeah. 
There has been times when people have sat, but it's not the exact chair from where she sat, and this is just another chair to put in there to show exactly where she would probably sat. And um, there's a few people who will be sitting in that chair. It doesn't matter, matter what chair it is, they'll sit in the chair in that area, and they feel maybe we can just say, right, come on, get up, this is my seat, you're blocking my view, you know. And, you know, so, and as Linz was saying about the, the gardener, the, his volunteer um, gentleman, he, he was a, a apprentice here the first time round, and the stories he told us, because he came back at the age of 80 and volunteered again to help in the garden. And when he came back, it was his 80th birthday, and that's the first time they were set foot in the house because they were never allowed to come in the house of gardeners. They were mm. always allowed to come up the front up the steps to the big the, 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 the windows. And Mr. Mitch would hand the tape back out to them and then talk to them if they were rubbish. But um, they were never allowed in the house and it was the first time they came in the house and you could, you could see the, the happiness and joy, the tears and all that, okay? But it was something they were done at all until they hit eight year old. And then uh, when you see out the window, it's like Mr. Mitchell would die when she sees this garden because it was at the time really overgrown and it wasn't, yeah. didn't have any TLC to it. But now we've got a dedicated garden team that's. I think missing much of herself would be proud of. But yeah, a lot of people will see her and will feel something there. There'll be occasional people will put their, their toys in that, that flash all different colours, they'll put stuff in there and it will be make a noise or flash like then again. Um we've had um people use the the voice boxes but produces words. Mm -hmm. And we've had um can you tell me who you are and we've had Annie. So um yeah, so but never seen her as such. Um, there was a couple of people come down a, um, a ghost hunt, and it was just a private team, and they were sure they seen a black figure walk through the garden. And we're not too sure if it was Miss Mitchell because she was dressed in black most times. But as I say, depending on how you looked at it, it might have just been just darkness, it could have been Charlie Class Class Cast or something else. It could have been Mrs. Mitchell's spirit, I don't know. So yeah. depending on what you believe. Yeah, it sounds like if you if you believe in the stone tape theory, that kind of thing. Yeah. Where past events are replayed and if obviously in the picture she looks delighted to be in her garden so if she has the, the feeling and the love for the place that she did as you guys are exp uh, explaining then if stone tape theory is a real thing then that could explain what was seen and yeah. what's felt yeah. um but yeah it's just as i say people do feel sometimes especially guys when they sit over there they didn't feel comfortable being across there on you go no no <laughs> i respect Mr. mitchell there is also another thing that people smell a lot of perfumes mm. in this room. I get it if I open the uh, shutters during, uh, when I first come in to do a tour. I open the shutters and I get lavender. This is an obvious thing. There is no lavender outside the window. No. It could account for that. No. Why is it always lavender as well? Uh, traditionally, it's an no older lady's uh, right. perfume. Uh, I've been in a hotel in Norwich. But they, they didn't put me in the, hotel, the haunted room, but they told me about a haunted room and it's the smell of lavender comes through in the middle of the night. Yeah. And that's when the ghost is there, so it always seems to be lavender. That would explain why. Well, traditionally, it's an older person's uh, mm. perfume. There have been um, cigar smoke smells in here as well, so I don't know if that's. I've been recently getting fire mm. smells. So I don't know if that's Mr. Wilson. Mm. Mm. Uh, or Picard, yeah. He was a character. But um, a lot of people say they have smell, especially because they cigar smoke. What does that smoke? Cigar smoke. You know, so. Uh, one of our former volunteers was Adam and she's seen Mr. Wilson. But yeah, he's, he's another one, as I say, when you talk about smells, it's Mrs. Mitchell is the dominant one here. And sometimes you can actually hear above us in the room above, which she'll be going to soon. Yeah. Um, you can hear people walk about and um, it sounds like the same, like the video I've showed you previous, it's, it's almost like the same path that's taken when you hear the footsteps above you. And there'd be many times during the day we've been having maybe a meeting here to discuss maybe upcoming events, fairs or um, just general things to do with the house and there'll be a group of us here doing strategy meetings and you can hear people walking above us and you think, well wait a minute, we don't want people in the house because somebody else came in and we go up and there's nobody there. The door to the room's closed mm. and it's like, can't explain it, you know. As well as the where the shop is, I've been underneath the shop and it's, you'll hear somebody walking in again and then you'll always hear them in their cane as well. Okay. So it's like footsteps with a cane, and apparently well, Mr. Wilson had a cane. So again, if you believe a spirit, then, <laughs> you know. But definitely above us, you always hear somebody walking about now and again. 
obviously not in queue, but <laughs> but we do hear it quite a few times. So, yeah, in that picture, he's got his cane in his hand as well. Yeah. Facial here as well. Mm -hmm. Are we happy when we can go upstairs? Yeah, yeah. Well, you you no, guys lead the way. Be very careful because there's no lights up here. Next, we move into the blue room. This room features an intricately adorned plaster ceiling, reminiscent of the Lay Hall. Some conjecture suggests that John Holbert and George Dunsterfield, renowned for crafting similar ceilings at Holyrood Palace, may have been the creative minds behind these exquisite designs. The room takes its name from the colour the walls are painted. The blue room is also where one of the most puzzling videos I've ever seen was taken, something that we discussed during the tour. So we're going into what's known as a blue room. So it is blue because of the ceiling. And again, we have, um, this is all handmade. This is Dunsterfield, and I can't remember the... We have Dunsterfield and another guy, they were um, working in Hollywood at the same time, through in Edinburgh. And we believe that they were commissioned to come and help put that thing up in there a ceiling up on the wall in here because uh, Hugh Patterson was actually signet to the crown as well. Yeah. So he would be in the right circles mm -hmm. and what may have happened is that he would have gone, oh, can you come and do a bit in my house because I've just got a new built house so I'm looking for a fancy ceiling. <laughs> so this is what we have here. I think this is the power of suggestion as well. But I feel different in here. I've been in here before and I felt fine, but I feel nervous and a wee bit worried in here now. And it's probably because of the video that you showed me. <laughs> and saying that people walk across here when so, there's nobody in here. So, so this room, um, people too feel vibrations on the floor. Even I have felt a vibration on the floor and then it suddenly stops. When you say vibration? The floor's moving. Jiggling. Um, <laughs> it's if somebody's walked past you. Ah, right, so right. say if I walk past now, you'll feel a bit of vibration right. um, yeah. on the floor. And there's no noise that accompanies it? No. It just feels like the floor's wobbling a bit, and then it'll stop. So I've actually been in the room and other people have said that at the same time. Right. It definitely feels different this time. But it, again, it could just be because of what we've been talking about. Yeah. So the, this room is sort of like dedicated to the, the Patsons. So we have uh, Hugh Patterson the third here, and this is her, his uh, lead wife. And we do actually have a man, maybe not necessarily uh, with an actual proper replica, it's just the style of yep. here. So this, the, over here we've got the crest of the Patterson. This is uh, one of our volunteers who is a vexologist who is the study and the creation of flags. So he has ha um, studied looked up on what the flags would be like because some of them do not exist. They would have been burnt at Culloden on the 45. Hmm. Quite a lot of them were actually taken through to Edinburgh, I believe they were, and um, they were set on fire to do with the um, Jacobite um, uprising, the uh, prescri uh, prescription, the you know, active prescription. Um, it, they didn't actually ban everybody. It was just men of military age, and then it depends on the area. Okay. And then that depends on who you speak to, what areas uh, they were banned. Uh, men, sorry, uh, men of military age couldn't wear tartans, depending where they lived. And then you, um, young children and women still wore tartans, but they weren't the tartans that you'd see today. There's a whole other episode here yeah. on that yeah. one. So this is an example over here. We've got a Highlander in anything north of basically Stirling would be Highlander. So you're in Lowland here. Uh, and then again in this corner here you've got one you put down and there's two uh, gentlemen either side. Uh, we have um, sort of close-up images of the whole plaster over in this corner. And this would be the Braemar standard which was raised at I want to say Falkirk was one of the Falkirk Mill, which is the image over here, which was uh, one of the ones that the, the Jacobite sympathisers of the army uh, actually won at that one. And then the flag over in this corner here is the steward flag, 
um, which were air would be gone as the king mm -hmm. was fired. And un underneath it, unfortunately, it was the Battle of Flodden, which was one of the last known battles to be uh, fought in the British Isles. Mm -hmm. well, that's uh, pitch battle, yeah. Yeah, and you can see totally different from that one. We have the blue bonnets of the um, the armies fighting the the governing armies that wanted to not let them win, and it is totally reversed on that one. Mm. So this is just a depiction. This room is sort of like decked out for the, the Jacobite. Uh, yeah. You know what we say? It's like era of the house because one Prince Charlie did actually stay here for a month in January, which then led on to one of the temples over there where he supposedly planned it. <laughs> what are the uh, cords coming down? Are they bells? So one would be a electric light uh, pole, and then you've got the bell pole, which is the other one, right. which would be that one there and the electric light pole from that one. So we, we did have a bell hop um, downstairs. It's actually being repaired right now. Um, there is no wires, so we'll never get up and running, but it will be put back on display at some point. Does the bell ever ring by itself? I've never been in here, and I think I would <laughs> exit very quickly if, <laughs> if the bell did ring. We've done a, um, a fundraiser of family one night one night, and uh, we decided to do a big group seance in the burnt room. And previously, it was just had a break, and then just uh, the group I was looking after, we were in the kitchen and in each box there is a bell that would ring. So there's a trigger over you see if it would ring. Uh, and I thought it would be great in the house because you'd have a lot of servants run about, bells ringing for them to come and uh, do their chores. And when we were called for tea, we put everyone in the box and left it there for the next person coming in with the next tea. So that's the we went into the board room, we were sitting down having a call of these and we were doing a call out and next thing we heard a bell ring. And at the time the bell hop was just sitting outside the bottom room on the table, so we were clearly they were on. And we thought that nah, couldn't be. Um, but we could clearly hear this bell ring. And then we realised that one of the guests for uh, 15 months from after says, Oh well when you put the case back, I just left the bell on top of the case. If it's that. So one of my, my friends just helped from the team, he went down to the kitchen and he says the sound when he rang the bell was the same sound, we could hear him ring it as well. And when he came back up, he says, you could put all the stuff back in the case because everyone was everywhere. And he said, and all the guests within my team were absolutely shocked and their faces went white and said, but we did put it all back. You know? Yeah. But the bell was clearly rang because the same sound that he made that bell. But we all thought it was a bell hop at first, but I don't know, I, I'm not sure if we've had the bell hop, uh, any sounds to sound, uh, probably even the bell hop would have sounded like mm. um, at the time. But I suppose that bringing that wee bell would probably be a close fit to it, but... Quite a lot of activity that happens here. Yeah. Should we yeah. go to the gallery? I felt the floor go when we were moving about, so I understand what you mean. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, the floor, and like I said, you'll be able to see the carvings and the, the plaster work better up here. Um, we do have some gilding, which we believe may have been a later addition, but obviously we need to have some sort of specialist in to check the, mm. um, the ceiling and everything. Um, traditionally, it would not be this colour. We believe this colour was added in the 60s when we had uh, people looking after the place here. They were not sure, but uh, it would have just been plain white. And we believe this is 60s paint that's on here. Mm. Uh, so yeah, you, you'd be able to see the plaster work even better now. Uh, we're not 100% sure what everything is up there, same with the blue room. Um, but what I believe, this is my personal appearance now, is somebody's given the plasterers or somebody who's designed the ceiling a description of what certain fruits was. And that's what they created. Um, there's some people think that it could be peas in a pod on this one here. Uh, that could be peas in the pod mm. here. And then possibly hops over in this panel over here. But again, if you've never, they would have potentially seen hops and peas. But if you've just given a description to somebody, it may not necessarily be what you have described. It's their own 
personal inter yeah. interpretation. It's like describing an elephant if you've never seen an elephant before. Uh, it depends on how you describe what you see to yeah. the person to how it comes out as a picture. <laughs> and in the centre there, would there have been like a, a mural or a painting? Yeah, uh, depending on who you talk to, there is either a picture underneath that paint or it would have been a panel on top of the paint. Right. So again, we would need quite a lot of money to get a spectrolysis person to come in to check the paint, see what is underneath it, because we just don't want to go up there with turps, white spirit, whatever, mm. and clean it because that would be sacrificial. Yeah. And it's, you would need to, a dedicated person who is a specialist in this kitchen to clear it and see if there's anything there. Or it would have been commissioned to have some uh, a panel put on top of that. The colour around the side. Is that a blue? And the uh, yeah, be, yeah, we've got. And is like that sixties like as well? Royal blue. We're not. Uh, we're not sure when that would have been uh, added. If it was a later edition, or I'm not sure if it was already there. It's we'd need to get a person to check the colour in to mm. see if it was yeah um, to the date. But generally, this would have been all white. It's traditionally. Such, such an incredible scene. Yeah, uh, like we do have an upper floor, but people aren't allowed up there um, because of the delicate floor. Right. We don't want it destroyed mm. <laughs> just by people walking back and forth. Yeah. There's a limitation of what can go on up there. So we, we have it all around here. We have images across the wall, walls of the upper hall here. They're all to do with the Wilsons of Bannockburn who were a owner at the time and they were actually involved in tartan and carpet making. They were actually the, do I dare say world leaders, but they were quite, well, they followed on from the act of prescription when mm. it got brought back in, um, to, when it became more famous to wear tartan again. They went from the military from wearing the tartan, they needed um, suppliers, so they won the contract. And it just snowballed. And that's that door there, yeah. that's the one that opens. Yeah. Children running up back and forward. Um, I, I get a feeling that there's somebody looking over the banister at me over here. When you're down the stairs? Yeah. It does have that kind of air to it. Why does it always have to be close to children as well? <laughs> there was a time, um, it was June, I think it was last Christmas fair, and um, my guest came in and she ducked into the middle of the hall and we were, folk were saying, asking why, why are you ducking? And apparently she's seen legs in the middle of the, the floor here. So when it goes back to this used to be one complete floor and it looks like if it's something just going back, doing its daily chores going back and forward, yeah. there's a possibility that's what she was seeing. But she ducked and she didn't believe in spirits or ghosts and that and she just thought something had fallen off the banister area. But she's clearly seen legs, but she couldn't remember seeing anything above it. That was pretty weird. That's kind of weird, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I missed it. Because <laughs> I was doing it at the car park. <laughs> so, shall we walk through to the room that is uh, supposed to be the one that one that Charlie stayed in? We then move into perhaps the most interesting room, dubbed Bonnie Prince Charlie's bedroom. Although there's no concrete evidence he stayed in this room, it's known that he spent some time here on a couple of different occasions, and it's here that he'd meet the woman who'd go on to have his only acknowledged child. Interestingly, a large ornate key was found, hidden in a recess in this room. Previously, the prince had been given the key to Stirling, which was then hidden, somewhere within the house. Could this key be the proof that this is the room the young pretender slept in? This room is reported to be the one that Bonnie Prince Charlie stayed in. This bed is actually a bit uh, newer, so he wouldn't have been in this one, but we've been told that it's quite similar to what of the period. So um, this room is an interesting room. <laughs> so it's decked out with a full person bed um, of styles. We do have some uh, items in here. We have a, a pig, which is a hot water bottle. 
Do you say that was called a pig? Yes. Never heard that before. <laughs> and then you've got the, the potty <laughs> or the chanty out here and you've got the, the wash uh, bowl and jug. And are, are these authentic from the time or they? No, these would be uh, Mira Edward, uh, Victorian era, yeah. Still hell of a old. Yeah. So it's just to show you what would be here. Uh, one thing that I do get if we have a school group in, I get them to pick that up and put it on the bed and I tell them what they what it is and they normally go, ew, <laughs> uh, which is great fun, especially when you're taking tours around. It breaks up, <laughs> breaks it up a wee bit. So I'm sure Paul can tell you more about this room. Um, this room is one that's argued on about if Charlie actually slept in this room or not, because a lot of folk believe we were slept in the last room or in the blue room. Um, like me and Lucy were just saying before we came through, it's got a grand ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, plus there was the, what we call the ante room just off it, which would have been big enough for a bed, so if you slept there, and met all the dignitaries and clan chiefs and everybody in that in the, which underneath the beautiful ceiling. Um, a lot of folks say that he's, he slept in this room because there's documentation or something, or there's some sort of... There is an attempted assassination, uh, but again, we're not sure if it's this room, um, uh, because it, it doesn't actually say it is this room, it says it's the room that Blake and Charlie so, uh, slept in, but it's, we don't actually have anything from the time to say where he slept, it's a later yeah. edition. Shame that he slept in this room. And the assassination attempt was somebody took a shot at him through a window? Yeah. Supposedly, yeah. Did they ever... Sure somebody was cleaning their gun. <laughs> ah, right, okay. That answers the next question. Did they ever catch who it was? No. And there, there's no evidence left on the wall? Like any bullet well, mark? Well, we've got or... the panelling, which is a later addition. So we would need to remove the panelling, yeah. which we're not going to do yeah. at this precise moment. Uh, because that is historical. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you would need quite... A lot of money, yep. as with most things, to get it done properly. But paranormal in this room, um, a lot of people before, like just now the bed's all roped off because you don't like to lie in it. But it's not as if it's a bed that's came back from when Charlie slept here or anything like that. It's basically a reconstructed bed. But people have always asked us to, to lie down on the bed to see what it would feel like. And some people say when they've laid down, they've felt somebody lying beside them. Um, I don't know if it's just because of the still the bed, but if you, you can feel it and it's just it's like a straw and horse mm. mattress. But um, the, the bed is roped off because we had a panel in the once. Um, a guy asked us to lie in the bed, they have lives saying there and you go. And two days later we got an email saying the guy's got a disease for way back when Charlie was here. Oh, <laughs> it's probably just been man for Did not again. expect that story. Uh, yeah, there probably... is a story that uh... Whoever lies in the bed gets uh, seriously ill uh, with pneumonia or things like that, which the is plague. what uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie supposedly had when he was here. He'd been on the battlefield in January when there's been snow, ice, cold wind, um, and then he came back to the house and he came down with this um, sort of respiratory disease, mm. which is where the story of him and Clementine. Yeah. started she nursed him back to health so there is stories more than one person has said that they've been seriously ill after sleeping in the, or lying in the bed but one it's not to the bed charlie slept in and it's not a bed from that era either so but yeah so for health and safety reasons they've put a rope in the bed so folk will be deterred by like lying on it i wouldn't mind that but um yeah it's not comfy but this room as lynn said it is a strange room because We've had many people here for different ghost hunting tours or just people come in for a walk around the history tour, even uh, a horror history tour that have came in here. And there's been many times people that go into that corner start, suddenly start getting agitated. They can be a bit more hostile. They can become uh, being quiet to more vocal. Mm -hmm. And it's a really strange uh, feeling uh, people say they get in that corner. It um, doesn't happen to everybody, but I've seen it happen firsthand with a woman that was, she was quite joke about and carry go worry type person, but just like laugh and say get the KST spirit and like everybody else. And she was standing in that corner and her whole demeanor just changed. It just, she was like, it's almost like she went depressed quite quickly. 
and she kept on looking at one of our guests and I says, um, I just turned into her, I says, you've got the look in you, you want to just attack that poor guy? And she goes, yeah, I don't like him. Yeah, they've been palling about, joking about the rest of the, the event mm. they were here. And as soon as she left the room, she was apologising to the guy, she goes, I'm sorry, I don't know what came over me, I just scanned and apologised to him, the guy said, oh, that was that, you know, but it was just strange seeing this woman all night joking about having to carry on and then she was just standing in that area. She just said that she was drawn to the area as well. Yeah. And then that was it. Um, there'd been other times where there's been women coming into this room and they've started giggling and laughing as if they're intoxicated with drinkers. Mm -hmm. They're just, and you could say anything and just start giggling. And it's, it's I, I don't know, understand why that would be the case. You know, as did they come in and just giggle away and laugh? And, um, people are going to each other, they're laughing with each other, with each other, just laughing. Um, there was a, a, a session in here once we heard um, there was an app you can get on your phone called a Spirit Talker. Mm. Now, it could be genuine, it could be fake, it could be just a parlour trick. But there was one time there was four people had one each on their phone and they were having a conversation with each other. It was like one would say something, another one would respond to it. And it would go around in a circle as if they were having a conversation. And everything made sense. It was, it was bizarre. Um, the only other thing that's happened is um, that door there um, shut one time, nobody could get open. And they all had to leave the building by going at the side door at the back of you. And then when we come back round, the door was wide open again. Strange. Well, just, so it's... this room, it feels like the rooms that you've taken me to, each of them has a different thing, a different style. Like the hallway, you're hearing things. In the library, uh, you're hearing footsteps so you're hearing voices then you're hearing footsteps the blue room is the room that the the video that you showed me so you yeah. there's you're seeing things this one's like you're feeling things in it yeah. like a sense of attachment you know you're picking up on emotions from people it's a it's a strange building it is it's a different layer yeah if i quote shrek it's like an onion it's got different layers to it it's like many layers but uh yeah it's i've I've been to many different places doing panel investigations and I've got to admit, not just because I look after the house now and I'm a volunteer, but this house is like a whole new ball game if you want to call it that. It's, you know what you're going into in some places and you come in here it's like what's well, a haunted house, you're like this. But it isn't until you go into them, it's like you say, it's different things happening in different areas. And then you could come in next week and everything could be swapped around. It's, mm. it's really weird. It really is. It's, it's different. And then you could come in another week and it's like, it's quiet and it's friendly. And it's... Yeah, I have to say that the atmosphere, or maybe how the sound is carrying, it's, it's not dead, but it's so quiet. And it feels like audibly it sounds different in here. I don't know if I'm making much sense, yeah. but this sounds like a smaller room. It's not really a smaller room. It just feels more enclosed and the sound's not working the way that it has done yeah. in the other rooms. Like it's it's dead quiet in here. Yeah. And it doesn't feel that quiet in the other rooms. Mm -hmm. And it could just be the you know, the, the panel and like you're saying on the yeah. wall, the bed could be dampening the sound. It just feels a wee bit different in here. To me the house is a personality. Hmm. Which way are we gonna go? Both the same. Listen, right. This one's quite a sinister room. It's been nicknamed as Bodyguard Room for some strange reason. I think it's because a medium came in once and said that this is where Bonnie Prince Charlie's bodyguard would have slept because she's come across the conclusion that's his bedroom, his bodyguard would have to sleep somewhere. <laughs> so he slept over here, so hence this is the bodyguard room. But I don't know what this room has ever been. I don't think we've got to the bottom. I don't know, I just think it's a stinky room. <laughs> I just think it smells. Yeah. But there's always been many different things happen in this room. I think sometimes women don't like it in here more than what guys do. Guys will come in and they'll start being a bit butch if they find out like, oh there's a male spirit in here that's quite domineering and he's quite a hard character and then the guys suddenly puff their chest out and just say, come on, I'll take you on type thing. Whereas women, as soon as they find out like, oh well, he likes blondes, then the women that have got the blonde colour here suddenly start getting a wee bit on edge. And so I don't know if it's like we've mentioned before, maybe just to play on words, mm -hmm. it's kind of affecting, like if you've can you seen that video and the blue room seems a bit yeah. different to you, it could be the same thing when you come into here. Um, but I have seen a woman with a blonde hair, with a ponytail up in the hair, 
and I've never seen it done unless somebody was holding it, and there was nobody holding my hair that day. Well, nobody I can see anyway. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was an experience. Um, we've had a wee girl on an open day. The door was locked. You'll see the hook that's on the door. Yep. It keeps it closed. Uh, that was on on the door, so stop people coming in. And a wee girl, I can't remember age, wee girl was, but I think she was about four or five or something. She came running upstairs in front of her mum and dad and the volunteer, and she came running into a room because the door was wide open, and she was having a conversation with a man. And uh, apparently the man was dressed in a skirt. And then she went into another room and seen a whole tartan regalia mm-hmm. already, yep. a Highlander. She said, oh, she said that. So it was some gentleman there, kill on in this room that she was talking to. Yeah, she was the only person in this room. Uh, the volunteer that escorted them back out said, come on, there's a bad man in here. Um, we don't know if she, it was an accident, that she lost her balance or if she was physically pushed, but she said that she was pushed down the stairs by something that wasn't there. So I don't know if it's because uh, the gentleman didn't take the kindly this wee girl getting taken out of the room, mm. that she pushed the woman, the volunteer on the stairs, or like I said, maybe the volunteers just lost their balance, we don't know. But knowing the person, uh, I would take her at face value. She said she'd been pushed, she's been pushed, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with her um, at the end of the day. But, you know, it's, it's easy to say you've been pushed if you've not, and, you know, it's, we don't know what's happened at the time. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, there's a lot of strange stories coming out of this room. It's definitely colder. I mean, we're closer to the windows, so that would, yeah. that would make sense. I'm wondering if, if people are, are not really thinking like that. They're, they're getting cold, so that automatically makes you a wee bit on edge, yeah. and that can help with that. And especially, like you say, power of suggestion. Yeah. If there are any blonde ladies in here? There was uh, one night that I thought was hilarious. We had um, because we do paranormal nights in here. We had a paranormal training night, and uh, one of my friends who helps run the team, he deals all the equipment and the cases, make sure it's all like batteries are charged and things like that. And he's quite a sceptical guy. And when we'd done the training night, um, we said, right, because you don't, we, normally when we're looking after paranormal team, we don't have a chance to take part. So we said, right, you can have a free night, there's cases, go and do a paranormal investigation of your own. And my friend, he was in here with a group of uh, volunteers, and they were just having a laugh. And there's a middle man come, and he said that this hand, this like black hand, came out the mirror towards him. And you heard him scream on the other end of the building. And as I say, this guy, you meet him, he's, he doesn't believe, but he wants to believe. Yeah. But that night really triggered something for him. I, I just need to check, you guys volunteer <laughs> to come out here yep. with stories like that? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm really willing to the clothes from the extension. We'll work the bolts in the extension, it feels a lot. You can go out before me. <laughs> Leaving Charlie's room, we make our way to the Victorian wing. Interestingly, problems with electrical equipment have been noticed in this room. You may hear some crackling on the recording that doesn't happen anywhere else in the house. Could this be explained, or is this another example of the spirits of Bannockburn House? So, uh, not much is known about these rooms here. Uh, it's not normally part of a public tour uh, because the ceiling over in the far corner of the corridor back there is actually not great so Mm. we don't generally bring the um, general public but it will be open for the Christmas fair I believe and we'll have stalls in here Uh, so we're not sure if this would have been a bedroom or something like that this is an interesting room for me because I, I used to, when I first started with the history tent, I actually worked in one of the rooms over there, which is the history store with all the um, different items. So um, I was forever seeing shadows walking past when the door was open. And we have had stuff move in there, but I'm not sure if that's vibrations from work that's happened or mm. unexplained <laughs> yeah. items. Yeah, so I'm sure. Paul uses these rooms a lot. Yeah. Um, these rooms used to be the ones that they did. They did have a caretaker used to live in the house when it was owned by previous tenants. And the caretaker used to live in the house just did stay in here in the caravan basically. And they used to stay in this room and the room next door. And they had big dogs and they used to run about the house as well in this area. And 
this room used, these, these two rooms used to like, smell of dog. For the next few seconds, you'll hear a noise like static interference. This only happened in the Victorian room. What do you think could have caused this? And now it's been cleaned up over the years, it's suddenly gone, but the whole rooms in general are just... This one in particular gets used a lot of photography shoots, probably because of the situation in the windows and also the shades long that stay behind you. Um, a lot of the men who have wedding as well, some of the brides that come up here and get a photo shoot done here. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, as I say, because of the way the light comes in both sides of the house here, because the window of that side, the window of this side, it drags in a lot of light. And photographers love this area. Um, I've seen many pictures and uh, models and that in this room, these rooms, compared to some other rooms in the house. Um, paranormal wise, it's, this can be quite, it's like a hit and miss sometimes, you know. It's, it's like you could be sitting in for a bus, none here, and then all of a sudden three appear at once. You know that type of scenario. Um, the other thing that sticks out in my head when we do a paranormal night here, and uh, we've done this thing called the, uh, I'm going to get this right, the Estes method, I think it's called. Yeah. And we use the Franks box with your headphones and just shout out that they hear because the radio is constantly just turning mm -hmm. out, you hear white noise and get voice in again. Um, what we normally do is we connect with two headphones and have two people sitting back to back and this one particular night it was like you get one person um, they'll shout out a word and then the next person will shout out something else and it's like it's not together but then one night it was like they're both in tandem and they're both shouting out the same word after word after word you okay? <laughs> um, and they're shouting the same word together and it was responding to things that we were asking and when we were asking the stuff, we were over this side of the room, they were over that side of the room. And even with the noise cancelling headphones, we were still trying to be careful to keep our voices down so they could hear us. Mm -hmm. So if we were saying, like, you tell us your name, they could just make something up on the spot. But having two of them sitting there saying the same thing was, I, I don't think you could even fake that, to be honest. You know, you, you could fake it if it was just one person saying stuff, but two of them saying it in tandem, yeah. and they were two strangers to each other. You know, and it was the things we were asking were even things that were going to the house that they managed to find out later, like, yeah, that's true, you know, because, and it's, it was quite remarkable. The only other thing that was quite funny in this area was um, we were in the room next door, and in the hallway, a woman had one of these, it looked like one of these, like, 90s type robots you get, and it just does all the flashing lights and its arms will move and things. And, so I sit on the carpet and I had this projector light on it, so it was like a sensor. So if anything walked in the sensor light, it would set this robot off me, you know, the flashing lights and the arms go. And um, they had movement at the end of the corridor. And I thought, somebody said, oh, somebody's shouting on you. So I thought, right, so I went out, set off this weird robot thing, went out, there was nobody there. And I'm like, well, whoever it was, that's why I went away, or it was just could be something bad, I don't know. But when I came back, the lady, the girl had reset the robot, which I thought was daft. I thought she'll just wait for her to come back in the room, then reset it. But as I was walking towards it, obviously it was going to be set off. And this thing started walking towards me, or, or basically sliding towards me. And I turned around to the girl and said, I didn't even know that could move. And she goes, Where did that? And when you looked at it, at the bottom, there were no wheels. It was a flat thing, and the legs didn't move. It was only the arms that moved. And this thing was moving across the carpet towards me. And the girl's face was a, an absolute picture. <laughs> it was like, and again, like most paranormal nights, when you get evidence like that happening, nobody's just talking. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's always the same. You're never recording when you, you should be. But yeah, there was that, and I was saying that thing of the Nestus method in here was bizarre. So, this, this room, again, the, the theme of everything's different is the electronics have been either responded to or messed with, mm -hmm. which is unusual. If it's, you know, it's mainly that's the occurrences that happen in this room. As well as that, in this room, the room next door, the normal view, there's no electric. You have to source electric from the courtyard along and up into the windows if right. you don't have any electricity in this room. So for to have, um, there's some devices that a uh, lot of panel teams use that, that picks up on, like, if I said too close to like, a mobile phone, it was yeah. set off because of the frequency. 
That's why you normally get asked to stretch your clothes and take the white mode in most times. So even if they had it next day where you think of the wires in the wall, it wouldn't go off because the wire is dead. There's mm-hmm. nothing in the power going through it. Um, so sometimes you get things like that happening, but it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's weird. It's like I say to people, during the day when you come into this house, you get welcome, it's like it's giving you a big hug and saying that when you come, it's like going to see your gran or something, mm. okay, and she's welcoming you in, and you have a big hug, glad to see you. But at night time it becomes quite sinister, like that neighbour you, you didn't like to bump into because they gave you the beer. And uh, sometimes it gives you that feeling when you come into the house at night, and it's it's like this in these two rooms as well. You come in during the day, like Linda will tell you, next door we usually sit in there because it's nice and warm sometimes, the chairs are comfortable, we'll plan things that we're going to do in the house uh, during the day, and it's it's lovely, it's warm and friendly, but come at night and you think to yourself, should I actually be in here? There's somebody going to put that cover on, there's somebody going to bang, and maybe something thrown at me, you know, it's, it's that, it's quite, it's quite sinister sometimes, you get the feeling in. Which is unusual because you guys kind of give the impression that you're used to the house yeah. and you're sort of accepting of what might or might not occur. So for you guys to actually feel unwelcome is, is unusual, I would say, yeah. You know, I can walk around the house and then let's say something happened and I don't feel like, uh, it's like, I don't know if you've maybe done something wrong to the house, you've got the house's feelings and it starts picking on you. you know, when you get things happening, or I don't know if it, if, depending on what people believe in, is it just spirits playing pranks because they can see you and you can't see them? Mm. You know? But um, yeah, it can be, as I say, during the day, I walk every day into this house, no problem during the day. And then at night, I can start to do it, and then you just get that one wee thing happen, and that's it. Do you want somebody else to come and join you? <laughs> you know? Which is fair enough in, in my book. Yeah. Are we going to go down the wooden staircase? Yeah. Did you mention that a girl had been seen looking through the banister? Or did, was somebody else that said that? Well, see there, there's been many times I've seen children look through the banister. Also, I've seen a woman going up the stairs and maybe getting up halfway and disappearing. Um, even there's a, a woman called Kellen that does the tea room uh, on a Wednesday for the volunteers. She does teas, coffees, even brings them home baking for everybody. And um, she's, this, she, can you mention these ghost hunts? Also? Are you doing your spooky things at the weekend, Paul? And it's like, ah, it's bizarre, it's nonsense. Till one night, uh, one day I went to pick her up, bring her into the house, and she says, see you on Sunday. Um, me and such and such heard voices out in the area at the stairs and I'm like, all right, and she goes, and then when I looked up, I seen this woman walk up the stairs and just disappear. And for her to say that was, was something, you know, so, but uh, she doesn't usually say anything like that, she doesn't believe in it all, I think it's all. Did she get an idea of the kind of uh, period that the woman was from? No, she just spoke freak because, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> fair. <laughs> seen this woman in this long, it was a long dress, in fact, a lot of people, I would say, by some of the recollections of what people have said about this woman, it's all roughly been the same type of woman they've seen. And if maybe go back to that stone cave theory mm-hmm. that we talked about earlier on, it's almost like she's Victorian. Right. You know, just by the style of the dress they're talking about. Um, but who she is, why she's there, I don't know. I don't know. There is one spirit that roams the house that a lot of people mention a lot of the time, and her name is Mabel. And Mabel was, uh, she was a housemaid, a uh, head housemaid. Yeah, um, we're not actually sure how the name came about, uh-huh. but we sort of started hearing the name being mentioned, saying, oh, that's Mabel doing that. But housekeeper, sort of maid type spirit is what people are saying for that one. How many? Spirits, do you think, are in the house? I've seen more than one. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have put my finger down on some of the things you, I think maybe you get maybe four spirits, and they could be the four of the same people but a different age mm-hmm. of their being or a different period of their time here. Um, but I couldn't really tell you how many spirits would be in this house. Um, I, I would say, I don't know. 
I think each room's probably got at least one or two in each room. You know, and that's again, if you believe in spirit uh, and believe what they do, it's they'll only come out and do all these parlor tricks that folk want them to do if they feel like like let's go and scare them and let's go and do this, you know. They want to be known. But then it's when you're not looking for them is when sometimes you really do see them. You know, so but it's really I, I couldn't have put a finger on not something I've actually thought about how many spirits are in the house to be honest. Um, but definitely more than one. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a kind of place like haunted houses. Yeah. Of this kind of ilk you feel like they're haunted because of the, uh, I think it's a guy called R Richard Felix, he used to do Most Haunted. Mm -hmm. He did, <laughs> was your dad here when we did the ghost hunt? Uh, he's a wee chap. Uh, yeah. yeah, he's a lovely guy. He t he's, is he friends with him? Yeah. He was telling me that he, he was friends with him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was listening to a podcast that he does and he was talking about people that, that stick around that become ghosts are like the charismatic people, the people with that persona, that charisma, and it's the charisma that kind of sticks around and that's mm -hmm. what makes them a haunt the place. And somewhere like this, where you've got Bonnie Prince Charlie, you've got titans of the kilt industry, the tartan industry, people like that, you know, power players of the, their era, that's charismatic people as well. You know, it it kind of does tick the boxes for your yeah. typical haunted house with famous ghosts. The thing about this house as well is, um, it's not just on the, in the house and the, the building itself. There has been people selling things outside in the gardens because the Banneford House estate is massive. Mm. And uh, there's something on the head to go um, And people have said they've seen or heard people chatting out in the grass area. Where normally you just hear, you probably hear just now on the motorway traffic on back yeah. and forward. But they'll hear folk napping about amongst them when they're out in the, the lawn out the back there. And they're just the only person there. Everybody else in the house, unless the sound travels, make it sound like there's a conversation going on about round about them. But then when you think the land, there would have been a lot of um, chief, uh, clans that camped outside. There would be French as well at one point when they camped outside. Um, the Bartley Banabon. Round about because so nobody can say exactly where it's mm. place. But then again, the fleeing soldiers yep. would have came past here as well. And there was a Roman road that went past at the bed at the bottom of the come in the main drag. There's a Roman road that used to run about there. Um, so there's a lot of history, not just with the history of the people in the house. And then also there was Drummond Hall as well before here. Yeah. So we're not 100% sure where that uh, is. Was. Aye, where it was, yeah. Um, and then also there was, um, in the area there was a lot of mining area, the mining as well, so there'd be a lot of people lost their lives in mines and that yeah. as well here, that maybe stuck to this land as well, maybe stuck to the house, and some people might see, or spirit see and hear in this house, might not necessarily do with the house, it could be to do with these things as well. Yeah, I mean, you've got the historical aspect of it, like you say, there probably would be troops billeted around here with mm -hmm. Prince Charlie being here. In nicer times, you would have had lots of garden parties, the social events, you know, people getting dressed up and really wanting to impress, that kind of thing. So you've got your historical, you've got your social aspect, your cultural side of it. So it's a real melting pot of people coming together. Yeah. Probably could, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're probably in this room in the dark. <laughs> I was, yeah. This is the burnt room. Yeah. It always brings a laugh when I'm doing the health and safety aspect because I always have to say the nearest fire exits in the burn room. <laughs> <laughs> it's just there. Um, yeah, I got the name because in 1972, a group of youngsters, don't know if they broke into and purpose set it alight or they're drinking, having a laugh, and they accidentally set it alight. Um, we don't know the full story, but regardless, the youngsters got in, set it alight, and the devastation you see just now as what was left. Um, some of it looks quite, oh, I don't know, the fireplace, I think it looks beautiful the way it is just now. It's shown some character there. I uh, hope they keep it the way it is. Um, but if it wasn't for the, the doors um, being closed, the whole house would have been damaged there. So. Yeah, well, you've got a, uh, we've been told that this is a fine specimen of cuboidal uh, mosaicing from the, the heat of the fire has caused this effect on the fireplace and 
the doors. It is actually a recognised thing that it had to get to a certain heat right. for that to happen. It's such a shame. But like you say, it adds another layer of character to the place. Yeah, we keep it this way currently because we do actually have Historical Environment Scotland come in and they show their students the construction of the room. Mm. So it hasn't changed. And as far as I'm on the understanding, it won't change at this precise moment because we still have a connection with HES. So it's a teaching aid yep. in that way. <laughs> and this is the Victorian era. Yeah, this is the extension here. Which you can see because the, the brickwork compared yeah. to the stonework. Um, I believe this room did have a grand piano in it at one point. I could have played East Enders then. <laughs> <laughs> and that tune as well. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this room they had. Uh, a REM pod set up at the door, um, which had a mobile phone that was triggered by vibrations and then cat balls went. The REM pod went off a few times and the phone would go off a few times as well. And we did automatic writing in here, uh, which was, was fun. I've never done that before. Um, I think that's all in the eye of the beholder, the results from it. But you could kind of see a bit of pareidolia. Somebody drew a four, the old Channel 4 logo. And then if you looked deep enough within the squiggles you could see a four in there um, so it depends on your, your take on these things whether you believe in it or not but it was it was interesting but yeah this is the room where one of our volunteers thought well they said they seen uh, Colonel Wilson standing at the fireplace having a wee whiskey and he was meant to have saluted her and give her a wee wink uh, his eye like towards her and that. Yeah, so that's if, if that's accurate, that's quite rare. You don't often get interactions yeah. from apparitions. But, uh, yeah, that's what she said that she's seen when she came in here. Um, not too sure if that's true or not, but I would say we'll take her word for it. Um, but judging by the fireplace, I don't think we would have been leaning up in the fireplace the way she said where he was. So. But it's a good, as I say, this would have been his prime enjoy room as well, because this is part of the Spence and Heath mission. Yeah. So this bit here, the next door in the dining room, uh, and upstairs, the ladder room we were at just a minute ago, uh, the two rooms up there. Um, this was that he commissioned to be built on to the original fabric of the house. So basically where the doors are at the top of the stairs, that would have been the outside wall. But and that's, that outline on the wall is where mirror. A, a mirror was. Yeah. yeah. That would have been some mirror. Uh, we believe that that was actually mentioned in the catalogue um, when an auction happened here when uh, Miss Mitchell actually moved because she was in a she was in a trust fund she didn't actually own the house as it was in the time when okay. she didn't own buildings. Um, the, a mirror was actually mentioned. A pair of mirrors was actually mentioned in the catalogue. Um, so we believe that they were never sold and they were just left in the house. So when it was abandoned. There was nothing in it at all. It was just the shell. Bare minimum, yeah. And the fire. Forgive the the daft questions, but like the, these features, the door, the staircase, is all original. It yeah, was completely contained. Yeah, that's. Yeah, you can see on the, the little cornice oh, yeah, here, yeah. and it is actually. There is actually um, some sort of bubbling in the hall as well, in the lay hall right. at the top. That you can see as well. Some so, of the ceiling you can see some of the damage as well because obviously it's gone through. But yeah, it's a, it's a good doors. I've kept the fire contained as much as possible. Uh, so we should have that in every home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's get some more Victorian doors. Yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, like I always think of abandoned places as completely derelict and graffiti everywhere. I'm assuming there was stuff like that and you've tidied yeah, it up yeah. is that because it's kind of it's quite out of the way so people just didn't yeah. bother with it? it was well we recently cut down the trees so you wouldn't have even seen it from the motorway right you would have to have known it was here yeah and it's the chances of kids coming apart from unfortunately mm -hmm. this one occasion there was also caretakers working on the site Right. At the time before the the Bannerburn house, the Bannerburn community bought over the house, there was a guy who owned the house and he had caretakers looking after it. Um, they spent most time in the house rather than the, they had a caravan, but they spent most time in the house. So that would have probably deterred a lot of people as well hmm. to coming in. 
uh, like the um, sort of Uber X, not Uber X, but people would say the Urban Exploring. Urbex, uh, yeah. Urbex, uh, yeah. I don't know what they call them. Um, so you can see a lot of them going into like abandoned buildings. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes they go into that building and think it's abandoned and it's true or not. So this probably would have been the same scenario. We'd probably come across it and feel like there's still somebody staying there. Plus, I think the care thing didn't have um, some sort of motor that builds a park outside the house as well. So it gave the general idea that there might be somebody else there. Yeah. I think yeah. they also had very large dogs. <laughs> yeah. Vegetarian. Well, that was quite a scary dog. Uh, some lively dogs. <laughs> so, if we come back, this, I put this at landing, um, just like all of that. Um, like with most uh, buildings, we have a mystery. A we big have a safe. safe. That is a big <laughs> safe. Um, because uh, you had all the different owners in here, um, so this would be the um, Wilsons, there is actually a um, news article to say that a so like bank was robbed and that's where i believe it to be the wilsons had the details and stuff this the building got robbed and they had all their items in here so this is where we believe this is the safe came in they had a safe put into their own house <laughs> to keep all their details can you access it no we Do you don't know? have keys do you know what's behind it? No. So there could be a fortune that could completely could restore fortune, the place. But I very much doubt it. <laughs> when the fire happened, uh, the, one of the fire officers that came to the house to uh, put the flames out said that he was sure that safe was open when he came in. But we don't know, probably because of the heat and that, when that shut over, if it sealed itself in some way, because we can't even get anything. We tried one of these cameras to go in. And we can't even get the cameras in because yeah. it's that sealed and that. Because it's a fire one as well, it would have an asbestos sheet in it. Uh, I'm going to take a step back from the <laughs> giant safe. It is safe as long as yeah. you don't start hammering it's into safe. it or, or like trying to break the safe. Licking it or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the safe is safe. So, kitchen. Dining room. Dining room. We can go into the dining room. So this is again a part, a part of the extension, the Victorian extension. So this is mainly, um, you'll notice, I always feel it's a lot warmer in here. It's still cold, <laughs> but it's a lot warmer in here. Um, so the volunteers use this as a, a dining room. We use this as, um, when we have tours, we use this as a, a Victorian tea room. And um, we serve, if, when people come on the tour, they get uh, tea served in China cups. Uh, part of the experience they get home baking and things like that into this room so it does actually give off mm. a warm feeling and you have the, all the home comforts as well in here i got wagon wheels when i came on the ghost tour yeah. which was, <laughs> was fine i like a wagon wheel but some home baking would have been nice <laughs> uh, depending on the event and uh, who's around at the time to what you get <laughs> And has anything happened in this room? Well, this room we used to get to a hub area. Um, as you know, when you came on to go on the shelf that day, a lot of teams use this as the base for them to come and do their meet, have their breaks, have their tea coffee, and do their meet and greet. And it's always done in this room. Not very many teams use this as a, an area to investigate. Um, to have anything happen in this room, mm, I have heard the window being chapped a few times. Um, that's when the shutters are open, there's nobody there, but I don't know if it's somebody that bugs for into the window or something. Um, but now this, this room, I've got to admit, is probably one of the quietest rooms. There was one occasion actually when we did see a walk in a bubbles in the room that above, which is, isn't the, um, the room we're in upstairs, mm. uh, there's one next door, is above this room. And that's the only time I've ever heard anything in this area. There's not really much happening. It's more of a case that this room has normally got lights on. There's normally people being noisy in this room. So you, I don't think you would hear anything hmm. anything happen. Hmm. Uh, is the wallpaper period? Is it original? That I don't know. No. It's nice. That's it feels like the, the most complete room in yeah. the place. So are we going 
through to the kitchen. Yep. Right, we're getting ready for the, the children's Halloween. <laughs> We leave the Victorian wing, head outside, and take a step back in time to the laundry room. <laughs> so, where are we going? Kitchen first? I mean, one Right, have you got is it open? I've got it. I'm going to say, and I'm assuming it's when you were doing the lock, it sounded like there was a whistle. I would think it's the lock. Like a... It was the lock. Good. It always does that. But my shoelace has come undone. Just wash that too. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to shut this door. There we go. So we are in the middle. Of this it doesn't normally look like this. We are in the middle of starting the decorations for. Um, the children's Halloween, so it's a bit <laughs> pickledy pickledy at the moment. So we don't normally have um, slate blinds on the windows, but this is basically as it was. Apart from the, this would have been all white, obviously. And the stove was to heat the room to dry the yeah. laundry. So this is more of a modern addition. It would have been, it would have been here. It would have had. A sink, a big tub in here. Um, I'm not going to take all that off. <laughs> so that would have had a big sink in there. That would have been your fire, you know, a big tub, mm. which would have then gone through to the kitchen and um, heated through the stove and things like that. And then you've got uh, more stove type things here. And then you would have had the irons all around here, and they would have used like the iron here. Uh, I think that that was a few. So how many staff would have worked here? Um, I, we're not sure. There are sensors that you would be able to look up. So you would have the iron like that, and it would heat up from this. And then you'd do that, start ironing, and then go to the next one, and next mm. one, and next one. So we do normally have a cat who is a third person interpreter. She dresses up in the style of the um, 17th and 18th century, sometimes a bit later. And then she explains all about how the ordinary person would have done the laundry mm. with all the different chemicals, um, the lye and the chamber lye, which is urine. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so they would have taken the, 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 they would have taken the piss from the uh, the chambers and then use that to um, clean the whites. Is that where the phrase comes from? Did not uh, know that. If you didn't have a, piss, a pot to piss in, that means you were very poor because you couldn't take your, your urine to the tannery or whoever, wherever and get paid for your urine. So quite Bet a lot. Of... Go bold and on. <laughs> <laughs> Is there still like a market? You know, it's a cost of living crisis just now. Potentially there might be, I don't know. <laughs> it's not something I've investigated. <laughs> Just thinking of other revenue streams. I might come back in, I don't know. Hopefully not, but maybe. <laughs> I don't know. In here, um, the only thing I can remember about this place during an investigation or anything ghostly was um, a couple of times people would be going to the toilet and they'll see faces at the window. Yet this door would be locked. Mm. Um, there was one time there was a um, team mountain and there was nothing happening here. And one woman at the police says, You guys shouldn't be in here. And technically, the guys wouldn't have been in here anyway because back then it would be a funeral environment. So the one of the, the team leaders said, Right, what we'll do then is if all you guys, we'll just go outside and we'll just leave the women inside. So we went out and we just stood on the other side of this wall. And we could hear them giggling, laughing. And what it reminded me of is the TV program my mum used to have been watching in the new year, getting that bit steamy. Mm -hmm. It was like dark, it was all the women gossiping, having a laugh, joking about. And then when we came back around and looked at the door, we said, You're alright, we're just standing saying, Nothing's happening. And they're just standing there, and there was nothing yet. You could hear, you could hear them. everybody. And we were like, one of the guys, he was, um, he was just juggling with his wife, he says, 
you can meet him here with joking about, with you laughing, with you giggling, with you natting away. And she goes, we've been sitting here all this time doing nothing. In silence? In silence. Because oh. we're asking out, nothing's happening. <laughs> yeah, when the, the faces are seen at the window, is it they kind of pressed up against the window? No, or? Be like, um, so for example, just somebody like standing here, just looking out, or maybe just going walking past. Okay, and on that note, shall we go to the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> Leaving the laundry building, we head into the kitchen area, a room with many original features still in place. Okay, the kitchen. You laugh as if this is the scary place. <laughs> So the kitchen, um, this, the, oops, sorry. the range here is sort of Miss Mitchell's um, legacy. It is actually, we do actually have a note saying that she has added this. Mm -hmm. She asked the um, trustees if she could buy a lot of range and that this is what we believe it was all done. So again, uh, normally we have Kat who comes in and does the third person interpretation here. So we have a range of implements here. So uh, we have the toasting fork here. We have um, the knife, sharpen your knife. And we also have the butter pats as well. So that we have traditionally often this here. Um, when you did, when you had a big household, you'd, you'd have pastries made. So this is a marble table. So you would have had your pastries made on the on this table because when you make pastries, you need the dough or the, uh, the dough to be cold. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now that's frozen. So again, here you, if you see over in that corner here, you see the different flooring that you have here, you would have actually, to start with, you'd have the dirt floor, which would have run all the way, and then as it modernised, you've got the flagstones, and then you have sort of concrete -y things, and then as you go over, you have the different types of lino, uh, over here as well. So this just demonstrates different eras in mm. itself. Uh, and you've got what would have happened with the uh, table as well. This didn't originally suspect this didn't originally start at this height, it would have been higher. So, with them cleaning the floors, the bottom of the table legs get damp, they rot, yeah. whatever happens to them, so they chop them off. So, they're still keeping the table, but the table's getting lower and lower. Must have been good for their backs. Yeah, because I know I'm on the taller side. So that is quite low for me, mm. and I would imagine it wouldn't have been that low when it was first made. <laughs> if it, especially if you look, that's more of a modern table over there, but if you look at the height of that one, compared to the height of that one, you can see there's a bit of a difference. Yeah, I guess they were shorter back in, in the older days. I think it, they, had... they would have been shorter as well as it being chopped off at the end, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as the bottom's getting damaged. So you, we believe that this is um, original to the house, but there's no way that we would have been able to take that out, to be honest. <laughs> so or, original as in when it was first built or Victorian? Uh, maybe Victorian, maybe earlier, but once that's in place, presumably that was made here, mm -hmm. and fitted in, because I don't think you'd get the top part through that door unless it came through the stones, but that's still the same um, height go through there. Um, here, if you look at the door to the side of you, we're not actually supposed to be going through that because of safety concerns, but that would be your store room, you'd have your pickles, your when you're ferment fermenting your um, wines, when you have your, your meats that need to be cured, mm. it would all be in this room here, which has a series of different room offits. Um, Things like that. This is actually used as storage. Creepy. You can see all the different rooms coming off. We use this as storage at the moment. 
because it's not safe for people to be in. Um, we then move into an area I know only too well, the basement. In September 2023, I joined Paul and other volunteers for one of the house's many paranormal nights and I spent 10 lonely minutes on my own in the unlit, terrifying basement. This area is absolutely amazing now. Um, up until, I think, just after January uh, last year, there was a lot of scaffolding along this way because the seal was starting to fall. I'm trying to blind you. You can see some of the rotten of the uh, mm. beams and there have been new joist beams being put in to you support. You can see the original ones. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's an original. And that's a replacement, obviously. So, and you can see the old <laughs> nails here. And so you, got... you probably seen when you came in, I think it was more than this. You can see the new floor in here. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen it upstairs as well. Um, after the Christmas fair last year, some of that collapsed. Wow. <laughs> Just didn't really close the door as well. Um, so they had to replay, uh, get it stuck in to get it fixed. It was scheduled to be repaired anyway. But it's brought forward quicker because it. So you were talking about how the sound plays tricks down here. I know that was a motorbike, but because of the way you were talking and the way that the sound caught, it sounded like somebody talking. Mm -hmm. But I know it's a motorbike, but it just shows yeah. how, how things yeah. can play tricks with you. But yeah, so now the, the guys have fixed the floor and they've fixed some of the beams and that, and they've put some rigging up here for the lighting and the pipes and everything now, and it's made this more accessible. Um, what they've came across is this would have been the original entrance to the house and then over time it became the servants entrance to the house and now it just doesn't have any entrance to the house at all because it's just a cupboard and it's an electrical one as well but um yeah uh so they would have came in here originally and i can't remember the year but uh boy on the queue and he'd be able to tell us because he's finding out more about it and uh, this corridor this is when i was telling you earlier i got to about here when i heard somebody walk behind me mm -hmm. And when I looked behind me that way, I thought, no, there's nobody there. I checked uh, the room there and the room along, but not that many there. I could have stood and listened, couldn't hear anybody above me. And I thought, oh, it was just somebody passing by. So I continued back along, got to here again, and I heard the steps behind me again. I got to about just before that door there, and I thought, no, nah, I've had enough of this. I'm going to catch them. So I turned around, nobody was there, and I say I felt that icy coldness going through me. And then I heard them going up the stairs. And then walking around the corner, there's a door, you'll see it's got a spring hinge on it. And when you let that door go, it slams shut. But when I go around the corner, when I decided to keep going, uh, that door was wide open. And when I put my foot in the first step, it slammed shut. So I don't know what was happening there. Um, but this corridor, um, well, obviously the light's on there. But when you're doing the, the paranormal night, um, you put your light here, and there's no other lights in the house. This place plunges into darkness. You can barely even see your own hands. Um, but we've, we've done many calls, calls here, we've seen movement on the stairs, we've had trigger objects that have just went berserk. I had one of these, um, it sounds like a, a shop alarm when you open the door and it makes that noise to alert the mm. shopkeeper or something in the shop. And it's a barrel alarm, so you put one device at one end and the receiver at the other end and it transmits this um, infrared line probably. And uh, we had it down here in the basement one day and it was gone off its rocker. It was just would not stop and we thought maybe it's the batteries drain because I know a lot of equipment when the batteries mm. start draining it starts giving off that sound so we put brand new batteries in and set it back up again walked away and it went mental again just something just kept going off all the time and it's one of the setting we had it on is as soon as somebody broke the alarm it would make the sound and stop this just kept on alarming 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 to the point we thought well just switch off at any point mm. it's going to interrupt everybody throughout the house um, other things as well as the uh, the door does I say where we walk I walk past and make I had to put six again. There was one investigation we were all in there and we could hear um footsteps come along the corridor and everybody was frozen to the spot waiting to see someone come to the door. There was a guy who was on the team at the time who used to go around just taking pictures to put on the group page to, uh, so folk could like see themselves and say, Oh look there's a picture I've been in. And he decided to come out in the hallway and he's got his camera and he's taking shot after shot after shot. And he's hearing the footsteps come towards him to the point where he could actually feel breath on his face. And he's still taking pictures and there's nothing coming up on the shots at all. It's an interesting place to be. Yeah. 
I'm okay because I have stuff in that room there. Um, it's okay during the day, but I'm not keen on it during the night. And it's nice when you've got lights on. Yeah. At night, I mean, you put that light off and it plugs into the darkness, it's like, run. <laughs> They've got the window there. Right, this is um, Gordon. It's Gordon's workshop. You've went past here many times, and it's as if somebody's looking back at you through the window. And you've come, you've just walked past, and it's just that split second, and you've come back and you think, there's nothing there. I mean, fair enough, I can see my reflection. But what you're seeing isn't your mm -hmm. reflection, it's as yeah. if somebody else is looking back at you. We've had doors slammed in here as well, which is a bit bad because of one, you've got cables going through here. One of the doors up there, I think it's the Christmas room that you got put into, it slammed shut one night. Again, nobody jammed, told me this. Jammed the cables. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a strange, interesting place. It's not easy place. to slam doors in here. No. That does not slam shut. There's no cables. It just doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an amazing place. Um, I think the first time we used this area when all the scaffolding was taken away and then obviously the rigging was put up, um, one of my uh, team members for the team and also she's a volunteer of the house as well, Darlene, she was, um, I think she was standing about where Lucy is and she's standing like her back towards it. And we had one of these, like, um, you know, the REM pod bear thing, somebody brought them along and they put them on the steps and that kept them going off. And Darlene, um, she's usually a giggly, laughy person. And she's standing there and she's, she's shaking. You can actually see her shaking. Poke her holding her hand and, like, said, Will you stop shaking? She goes, I can't help it. And it wasn't cold. It was just, there was something else affecting her. And the next thing, the, the bear started bleeping and she screamed. Right, and everybody along this end who couldn't see her <laughs> started screaming as well. It was like a scream fest in this <laughs> corridor. And when we got her calmed down, she just, just when we got out of this area, she says, I'm glad we've moved. And I'm like, hey, what's up? She goes, there's a, I'm sure there's a guy standing behind us because I could feel him tapping on the shoulder. And he was breathing in my ear. I goes, why didn't you say? <laughs> That's what we come here for. And she goes, I was too scared to move or do anything. We finish our tour with a visit to the shop where the footsteps of one of the previous owners are often said to be heard. You know, and that's what she felt when she was standing, just sort of about, yeah. But again, going that way? yeah, during the day, you come in here, the lights coming in through the windows, the, the whole place just seems friendlier. Somebody has a high-vis jacket in there. Yeah, there's a high-vis jacket in there. You can see this door when you go in the corner. It's on a, a spring bench. Oh yeah. So you have to keep open, so I mean, look at that, it's, it's slammed shut already. Yeah. And that and was just, open. It was just stuck like that. And I put my foot in the first step, and then it just didn't even come that slow, it slammed shut. If that was me, there would have been a, a wing shaped hole in the door where I was running away. <laughs> Back what a place. The only other room you would have seen is the Naples uh, flat, which is out of bounds. Uh, very top floor, the majority of that's out of bounds. Uh, the shop, um, that's not out of bounds. I can quickly show you the shop if you want to see the shop. I'm going to show the shop, Lens. Now there's only one key to this shop. Shop. Volunteers make majority of the stuff in here. No, there is a lavender smell in here. There is lavender. Yeah. Underneath here just now is in the basement. There's a room that stores all the chairs for the functions. There's tables for you know, things like that as well. Me and my colleague were just into the chairs to set up for an event in the main hall, and we were down in the basement underneath where the chairs were kept, and we we're just basically trying to see. Um, I think there's a certain table that we knew that was down there that would fit for what we needed it for. And all we heard about up here was the, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier on, it was like footsteps and a cane. Mm -hmm. right? And you'd hear the, and then bonk, and then step, step, clunk. And we could hear it up here, and I thought, what's upstairs again? Oh, it's a shop, let's go and see, because some of them must be in, because it was only us two that was in. At that point, Alan uh, Buckingham, who's the operations manager of the house, 
here just came in and he normally comes in here to do stuff in here and I said to him I goes you're in the shop you've been in the shop I goes we can hear somebody walking in the shop and he goes no I've just came in the door and like I said it's the only key in the house we've got for the shop we had to go into where I got the key from come in unpadlock that door to find out if somebody was in the shop or not <laughs> you know and if there was somebody locked in the shop we would soon hear it because yeah. we'd want out as soon as possible but we came in there was not a single person here so then above this room is the bottom and chiller room the bed right so um to explain what happened that night that day don't know we went downstairs we asked him again we had a couple of thuds but nothing compared to what we had heard with the cane as well so and there was nobody in this room so the time it us to come up because that stairwell there was directly in line with the room as so you'd come up you'd see somebody come out here put the key back mm -hmm. lock the door in and there was no time to do all that yep. and when we left the room in the chair you could still hear the, the footsteps and the cane sound on the floor so as i say for the time we're getting out here lock the door put the key back come back out without getting caught it's impossible yeah so, if it's somebody walking with a cane uh, even if they did have a key which they don't no. they're not going to make a quick getaway no you, you know they'd, There'd be evidence of them there. You'd Even see them. Even if somebody with a cane just to act it out, and they didn't need a cane in the first place, and just a prop, you still, I don't think they would have that time yeah. to get out before we came up the stairs. Yeah. Because we rushed up to, because we thought somebody broke into the house. Yeah. So, but no, we didn't know. And Alan's like, he doesn't believe that much, eh? So he's like, didn't happen. <laughs> I never then, heard it didn't happen. Then. <laughs> Uh, then he was in here one day uh, doing some paperwork for the shop and he heard somebody walking upstairs. So he's heard something as well, but he'll not tell you that unless you push him. <laughs> so it sounds like footsteps are the, the most common occurrence yeah. in here. And then you've got your video, which I still think is one of the... Yeah. You know, I've seen a lot of stuff on uh, paranormal programmes and things like that. And that, that video, when you showed me, I actually thought at first it was like a time lapse. Because the way that the, there's a shadow that moves across. And then the, when I tell people about it, the only way that I can describe it is it's like the bottom half of the Predator from the Predator film walks across the room. But it sort of glitches in and out. You can see parts of it form and then it disappears again. It's, it's the strangest yeah. video that I've seen. See, when, when we've seen it, it was almost like a bad If somebody had to come up to me and show me that first hand, I'd think, right, that's a camera glitch or it's this or it's that or it's, um, it's been doctored in some way. But to get even that perfect, without how many flaws that you could actually say, well, there's where it's been yep. done. It's, to me, um, it annoys Karen because I still always say to him, it's, it's too too good to be real. You know, it's, it's, it's that, that way it comes across. But the way that, that track cam works, the way Karen's got it set up is, you can have it, there's, I think there's three different stages of it, you can have constant record, so record, constantly until the battery goes dead or this, the card becomes full. You've got, um, as soon as the um, infrared's been triggered or somebody's walked in front of it, it'll take a picture. Um, or it'll do a picture and a 30 second video. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened up that video there. There's a, a, been a picture and then a 30 second video. That's why it cuts through it so quick, because there's only taking the 30 seconds. Yeah. But after that 30 seconds, um, even Kern said he goes, that presence is there. It's obviously been there after that thirty second was stopped. Why is it not triggered a second time and came on? So that's what's confused him as well because mm -hmm. it's just not. So we'll put track cams up there every so often to see if it can harm again. There was one point where we heard um, we, that we took a picture of a thirty second video, and we've heard like as if something's moving, but it doesn't really seem to. Like if this is somebody actually walking about, mm. um, but no, it's we just it's, it's just a weird thing altogether, you know. The yeah. only other time we've had anything like that happening, where I've but we were up in the room above that blue room, uh, which is outbound at the moment. Uh, last year, uh, Carl B was up with Most Haunted to do a celebrity meet and greet thing, a wee ghost hunt, and I was shown on the room, and there was a couple of guests came up with us. Um, because they didn't realise they would stay with our group, they followed us up because they thought that's what they were meant to do. And they were standing in one corner of the room, and we were standing at the door. Carl was standing in the middle of the room, and he's, he was like, just like you're talking about earlier on, he says, it's got this 
weird presence, kind of weird feeling in this room. It's different to the other room we've been in, and just similar to what you've been talking about tonight. And all of a sudden, there was just, it was like, as if, like, um, you know when, like, a cloud goes over the sun, mm. walks the sun, and you see the shadow moving, casting yep. around the room? It was like that came down from an angle from the ceiling in front of the two guests that were in the corner. And I went, oh, wow. And Jenny Bryant, who was the location manager, she was standing next to me. She goes, what, what, what is it, what is it? I goes, oh, just, it was like, the sun's cast a shadow down the corner in front of the, the couple of there. I goes, that's quite cool. And she goes, what shadow? And I go, the shadow there. I goes, you can barely see the couple in the corner. She goes, I can see them clearly. And I'm like, away with you. I goes, there's some cast a shadow. And Carl, he put one day was talking, he goes, what is it? And it goes, well, I don't want to alarm the couple, but it was like a shadow came down from, it's like a car's headlights, that's what I thought it mm. was. It's come down, but where we were, there was no way the cars, because they come down below the tree line. And I said, it's a car, I can't like cast a shadow in the corner. And he's looking and goes, I can't see a shadow. And then the couple in the corner, they're getting a bit panicky at this time, like, eh? And I says, well, I, goes, I don't know, just, and then like, this thing just grew up. But even Jenny seen this like black mask just form in this corner. And she goes, what the hell is that? And I said, I tell you, it's just a shadow. She goes, that's not a shadow. She goes, it's been cast for some car outside or whatever. And I says, I goes, ah, she goes, ah, oh, this looks pure evil. I goes, it does look evil. It doesn't sound, can, the way it was, even though it was a black shadow, there was mm -hmm. something about it that didn't feel right. And Carl goes, goes, what is that? And I goes, well, and Jenny goes, a shadow looks evil as hell in that corner. And he goes, how can a shadow look evil? It's just a mass of colour. He goes, trust me, that just looks evil. And he goes, right, if you're in the corner, come come face me. Come and show me you. And we just seen it move right into this in front of him. And he was oblivious. He couldn't see it. And we were like, Jenny going, I can't believe how close that is to you, Carl. And the couple, they had actually seen, it was like a change in lighting in front of them. But they didn't notice before. And then Carl's like, hey, come on then, he goes, show me what you're here for, what are you, what are you doing in my for? Come on, do your best to me then, come on. Right, and it just stood there, this mass, right, it wasn't even a human shape, it was just a mass. And uh, I said, I don't know, it just seems like so messing. I goes, I goes, Ken, what? I goes, you don't belong to us, just bugger off. Well, this thing just charged towards us. Jenny's like, <laughs> like that to me. And she's like, it just, it came right up and then just went, Chum. Just evaporate. But what we didn't notice that Carl and the guests noticed is you heard uh, as if it was running across the flare. We only seen it coming towards us and me panicked. Well, I didn't say I panicked at the time, but I did panic because this thing was coming towards us. And Carl and that said they could actually hear the doom, 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 doom as if it was running across the floor charging us. So some of you saw it and some of you heard it. Strange. You gave me the chills. Ah. So it was me it, thinking that everything's all right in here, <laughs> and there's but evil black shadows. Again, during the day, you come during the day, guarantee if you came here on a Wednesday afternoon, or any time between 10 and 2, and get a nice cup of tea for Helen, or plenty of home bacon, and you get a wee tour in the house, you'll think, okay, this is completely different to what you've just done tonight. Mm. You know? And then everyone you felt like, for example, Boniface Charles room, the way you felt in that room, you got there and you think, this is a room I can stay in. Compared yeah. to just now. No, I couldn't stay in that room. No. Yeah. It's like the guy here with the, we have with the cane in here. That could be somebody stamping about the next time you hear it if it does happen again. Um, it's like in the library, we'll, we'll have the app, well, that's the same with daily paranormal stuff. Um, we'll do a sense in there. We could be in there and like there's tam on the table, there's, there's boots flying off the shelf, there's running above us and the ceiling above. And, and then the next time we go in, it's just why we're here. Mm. Nothing happening, you know. It's, it's as I said at the start of the night, of course, like, if anything's going to happen, it's going to happen. If it doesn't, then we can all put our hands up and say sorry. <laughs> Aye, and the thing is, you're in a, a historic old house, mm -hmm. and that's what people should really be appreciative of getting a chance to walk around a place like this. It's great. Aye. For me, I don't, the only place that I have an issue with is the basement, but that's not a get out of you feeling. It's a you shouldn't be in the basement. That's the feeling I get. Mm. It's not a run for your lives. There's a dark entity down there. It's the, it's the. This is not your place to be. That's the feeling I get. Have you got anywhere that you don't feel comfortable? Not the moment. <laughs> <laughs> all these after all these stories, I don't think I'm comfortable anywhere. To be honest. <laughs>
you're a newer volunteer. Yes. I'm here because uh, my, I'm doing, this is part of my college stuff, so all right. I'm not here like all the time. This is like my, I think, third time I've been here like for this so kind of stuff. So the college stuff, is that more the volunteering for the upkeep of the house? It's or? like a work placement thing for me. Ah, house. right, got you, no. understand. I was wondering if there's a course for Parapsychology <laughs> no. or paranormal. Did that have done a course for paranormal studies or something? Yeah, he did. I don't know what it was, but he went to this and did all this courses for different. I think there's like four different courses, and he gets he gets stuck at the end of it. So. Cool. I think you can do something like that in Edinburgh Uni. They've got a that's where the Evelyn Hall, the woman I was telling you about. You ever watch uh, Spooked Scotland? Ah, I she's uh, Ryan O'Neill, that's the tech guy. He uh, comes here a lot. Mm, does he? Uh, he seems like he knows his stuff. Um, I'm sure she does the parapsychology in Edinburgh. Uni. Anyway, I, you guys need to get home and I really appreciate you giving me the time. As we wrap up our journey through the historic halls of Bannockburn House, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to Paul Hannon, Lindsay and Lucy for generously guiding us through the rich history and ghostly tales that reside within these walls. Their passion and dedication have truly illuminated the depths of Bannockburn's past. If you've been intrigued by the stories, I encourage you to consider visiting this remarkable site in person or contributing to its upkeep through donations. Bannockburn House relies on the kindness of individuals like you to preserve its heritage, ensuring that its doors remain open for generations to come. Together, let's play a part in safeguarding this historical gem. <laughs>